Okay, uh, the next chapter is wakefulness and, and sleep cycles. And we're going to have a couple, maybe three, four parts of this, as I've learned that I need to make these a little bit shorter than, than the last slideshow. Uh, the movement disorders was my first slideshow, so I missed saying welcome back. Welcome back from spring break. We are uh, officially back, and um, I know we're receiving content in a really different manner. This is not particularly comfortable for me, but here we are, and I hope you all feel safe and healthy and know that that is the most important thing, given the way the, the world is today. Uh, so let's move forward into wake and sleep cycles. As we're going to talk about how we have these circadian rhythms, so rhythms that occur about every day, circa Adian, uh, he starts out, um, Callet starts out talking about how uh, many animals, and I feel like most animals, generate endogenous circannual rhythms. I think even we have some hormonal changes that occur during spring, a lot of things that are less, less obvious than what we see as far as animals who hibernate through the winter, animals who store food for the winter, that they start this relatively early on. And I like the example of birds' migratory patterns because, um, or the butterflies' migratory patterns, because uh, they're, it's clear that for them to come south for the winter, that there might need to be, there it might need to get cold up there, but that's not actually what's happening. They have internal mechanisms that are operating on this annual cycle and they are driven and so to to go south for the winter and so they're driven to go back north there's nothing there's nothing specific about the weather necessarily that, that tells them they need to go north they know it's time to go north and all animals have these endogenous circadian rhythms so endogenous is um, generated within ourselves right uh, that these internal mechanisms that operate on an approximately 24 hour clock, not an exactly 24 hour clock. Uh, so there are uh, other aspects of our world that help us to um, reset our cycles. The most clear cycle that we have is wakefulness and sleep. But you'll notice that there are times during the day when you're in a better mood or in a worse mood, uh, that you are more likely to eat and drink, your body temperature changes, probably don't notice that, but your body temperature changes throughout the day, uh, hormones, sensitivity to drugs, uh, urination, all of this is also influenced by these endogenous cycles. And even in the absence of uh, whatever changes are occurring throughout the day, daylight, we can see consistent rhythms of activity uh, and sleep. Uh, your author gives us the example of, I think this is a flying squirrel, and that is kept in the complete dark, and then they're watching the waking cycle. The dark blue um, lines there are the waking cycle, and you can see that that flying squirrel is waking slightly earlier every day, so slightly less than 24-hour clock. But I've seen other examples, so um, mice on a running wheel that um, in the complete dark, they have a slightly longer, maybe almost 25-hour period, uh, your author gives us the example of people who are on a submarine, appear to have about a 24.3, 24.4 hour period. And he also talks about people who live in Antarctica, where there are times where there is no light and how um, they can get irritable, of course, but they also, they are drifting off of this endogenous cycle, or they're drifting off from the 24 hour day cycle in an individualistic kind of manner. So as I said, other things, other aspects of our lives are influenced by these endogenous cycles. One is body temperature, and he shows here how we have our highest body temperature really probably late in the afternoon. And then as we get to sleeping and onset of sleep, it's usually about two in the morning, uh, three in the morning, that we have a really low body temperature. We also see an effect on our mood of these endogenous cycles. So this comes from a, a study where they had uh, students come in, uh, they kept them under constant light levels and kept them awake for 30 hours. They either came in at 10 a.m. 
or they came, came in and started at 5 p.m. And you can see that regardless of what time they started the study, that people said their most positive mood was on average around 5 p.m. and their most negative mood was on average around 5 a.m. Our endogenous cycles change a bit over our lifespan and actually we're gonna, we see that in other animals as well that uh, their cycles change as they, as they age. Uh, as when, when we are very young children, we tend to go to bed early and wake up early. So he has here starting at 10 years old at our midpoint. So what's on the y-axis there is uh, the midpoint of the night. So 3 a.m. would be I went to bed at 10 and woke up at 8. Uh, this, this gets later and later, and you see this peak uh, right around late adolescence. And then we start to get slowly closer and closer if you know how your grandparents work they're doing something that looks a little bit more like children of going to bed pretty early and getting up um, pretty early and after they tend to start sleeping less and less so they're going to bed early and waking up very early um, this uh, this change where we see adolescents tending to stay up late and wake up late this occurs in other species as well, which I think is rather interesting. And I have seen one person talk about this where um, he also shows this, this dip that we tend to have in our circadian rhythms after lunch that adolescents just don't have that. And if we let them, they would have this kind of longer clock. Things that affect these biorhythms are called Zeitgebers in the German, uh, German for time giver. Uh, sunlight is a major Zeitgeber for humans. It's actually a major Zeitgeber for land animals. Um, the tides are a stronger Zeitgeber for marine animals, and those are the strongest Zeitgebers. We also have other things um, about our lives that affect these rhythms. So physical activity, if you've ever heard that you probably want to do your physical exercise early in the morning, or at least earlier in the day, you don't want to do the uh, physical exercise in the evening as it'll tend to keep you awake. Uh, eating, uh, temperature outside, sleep-related hormones, these are all also Zeitgebers. We have our free running circadian rhythm, as I mentioned before, that we have a slight drift from the 24 hour clock if daylight is not a factor, uh, which I mentioned for the submarine workers and for the um, people in Antarctica. But we see this again with other, with other animals as well. If we use something other than sunlight as our Zeitgeber, it tends to lead towards depression, irritability, and impaired job performance, as we will see when we talk about shift work. We can see clear effects of how light affects us as a Zeitgeber. This, this kind of study has been done in several countries, but these data are from Germany, where you can see uh, the y-axis is the midpoint of sleep again. And if we look at the, so all of Germany is in a single time zone, but what's happening in the West, right, is that the sun is coming up later and going down later than in the East. And if we ask people, if they were just allowed to go to sleep and wake up when they wanted to, uh, when would that happen? We see that their midpoint gets earlier and earlier as we move towards the east where the sun is coming up earlier and going down earlier. When talking about setting and resetting the biological clock, uh, it's good to talk about jet lag as it brings this to bear. Um, when we change time zones, we have a real mismatch, right, from our internal circadian clock of what we're typically on and where we are and the external time in the world. And as if you've traveled, you realize that going east is much more difficult than going west. Going east is causes this what they call a phase advance. So if you think about it, if you are a person who sleeps from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. and you go from the west coast to the east coast in the United States, this is um, now you are uh, feeling like you are, have to get yourself to sleep by 7 p.m. It's difficult. You have to get up at 3 a.m. And we all know how hard that is. I stole this picture from uh, Laura Freeberg's uh, physiological uh, psychology textbook because I like, I like the clocks and that it helps us think it through. I also like the smiley faces and unhappy faces. So going east, we have an unhappy face as we are forcing ourselves to bed and getting up 
extremely early is how it feels. Whereas going west is what they call a phase delay. So if I sleep from 10 to 6 typically, now it's going to feel like I am just have to push through to 1 a.m. and stay up. And that's not too hard to do. And then I get to sleep in until 9. So going west is much is much easier. Your author here and most of the authors I've, I've read talk about stress and the effect on uh, cortisol levels of changing these time zones very much. So when we when we take change time zones, we do see uh, a raise in our cortisol levels. And if we're doing this a great deal, this gets to be a pretty consistent raise in cortisol levels, which can be really um, deleterious. Uh, so they have a study looking at flight attendants who cross time zones, and they have found that uh, these people have smaller than average hippocampi. So where we lay down our new explicit our new explicit memories uh, from this kind of consistent raise in cortisol levels. And as I mentioned before, uh, when we're using something other than light as a Zeitgeber, that we have some depression, some irritability and poor job performance. Uh, if we look at shift workers, uh, night shift workers tend to sleep more poorly, feel groggier, groggier at work. Their body temperature is continuing to peak as they are sleeping. If you go back to that body temperature um, figure that that's really uh, somewhat based on daylight, not just our sleeping schedule. So that, that's working against each other. Uh, they tend to have more accidents than day shift workers. Uh, he does mention here that if we have truly blackout curtains and can sleep in the dark, and if we are working in a place where the lights are truly giving us some sense of sunlight, that they're really strong lights, that that can help. And here are figures showing that um, the daylight saving change when we spring forward. So we have that same kind of phase advance that we saw when going east. We actually see that this correlates with more heart attacks. If you look at the Tuesday after the spring forward, so when we go back to work on Monday, the Tuesday after, uh, we have significantly more heart attacks than other days. And if you look at the fall back, so the phase, the phase delay, um, we are doing a little bit better on that Monday morning in the in the B figure. It was Kurt Richter who introduced the concept of the brain having its own kind of biological rhythm, that it's the brain that is influencing our biological clock. And we have discovered that this is happening in the, or occurring because of the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus. That's a fun bunch of words that you can say. It's a mouthful. You can say it again and again with your friends. Superchiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus. Superchiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus. You can shorten it to SCN, but it's a great, the nomenclature is great. Supra on top of chiasmatic on top of the optic chiasm. So we have these retinal ganglion cells in our eyes that are going to send information about the, um, about the relative light uh, to this area of the hypothalamus and helps us to control reset our circadian rhythms um, for our sleep and for uh, body temperature and everything and everything else and so forth. Uh, this continues when removed from the body. So they have taken um, cells from the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus and put them in tissue culture and they continue to have their same biological rhythm. And the more cells that they take, the stronger that rhythm. Um, one of the studies that has looked at this looked at um, hamsters, and so there were these hamsters that genetically had a 20-hour biological clock. Most hamsters, or like most um, mammals, have a 24, about a 24-hour biological clock. But So they took these hamsters, the fetuses of these hamsters with a 20-hour biological clock. They actually did this in both directions. They um, surgically transplanted just the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus from the fetuses into adult hamsters that normally that had had a 24-hour biological clock and it changed those hamsters biological clock to be a 20-hour biological clock and and vice versa they've taken the 24-hour hamster fetuses SCNs and, and transplanted those so it's the donor that's uh, important here 
So as I just mentioned, there are certain retinal ganglion cells that are responding to light and they are sending their information to the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus. And they are doing this along what's called the retinohypothalamic path. And this pathway is uh, named as many of the pathways are named of where it starts in the retina and where it ends at the hypothalamus. And this again is going directly to the uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus so that light can help us reset our internal biological clock. Uh, these retinal ganglion cells have their own photopigment. If you remember, the photopigments were in the rods and the cones. We had rhodopsin in the rods, but these retinal ganglion cells have their own photopigment called melanopsin, and they respond slowly. So they're responding to, I want to say, ambient light levels or where you are generally in, in light levels. If you have a sudden burst of light or darkness, that's not going to affect them. So if you uh, have to get up in the middle of the night and go to the bathroom and you turn on the lights, that's all fine. It's these, when you're in the light for a while, we'll see a change. So this is a nice picture of showing the, uh, so in A, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, he's pointing to it there. Um, that it is active in the daytime. So this is one of those studies where they injected 2-deoxyglucose to see what brain areas were active. And A is showing us in the daytime, the SCN is very active, and B is showing us at night, it is not active. And we're gonna see the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus is actually communicating to other areas to influence our sleep-wake cycles. One of the main regions that the SCN influences is the pineal gland, this endocrine gland just posterior to the hypothalamus, sorry, to the thalamus, uh, and it's releasing a hormone called melatonin. So what the suprachiasmatic nucleus is doing when it's active is stopping the release of melatonin. And so we'll start to produce melatonin as we've been in the dark long enough. So when we're looking at our screens and on our televisions, we're not allowing that to get turned on, basically, or for the SCN to get turned off, basically. Um, melatonin secreted at night makes us sleepy because we're diurnal animals, but nocturnal animals, they're going to have the same kind of thing going on, but melatonin is going to be what helps them to stay awake. Okay, this is the last slide. Again, I want to welcome you all back and I want to encourage you to feel free to ask me questions um, over email or however and I will uh, try to set aside just a few minutes um, every time, maybe have a really short slideshow of answers to questions that I that I get and hopes that it means less emailing and, and um, typing back and forth. Uh, I've had some time and I've been really enjoying reading your uh, homework threes, some of your applied homeworks, and um, I miss, I'm going to miss seeing you guys these next couple weeks if this is really strange for me. And again, I hope you're all, I hope you're all doing well and I'll see you or I'll um, talk to you next time.